Okay, so I'm going to uh, come in as if I just had made the announcement. And I'm going to run through the show just as I would do it. Then later on, we'll do the uh, annotated version of the show. All right, how's it going there, guy? Oh, yeah, that's right, that's good, that's good. Okay, my name is Eddie Goldstein. I'm the senior space science educator here at the museum. And this is DMNS Weather Central. How many of you have ever uh, gone to see a, a TV show actually being broadcast? Oh, you are in for a treat here because that's what we are going to do. This is like a television show all about the weather. And I'm going to be asking you to use your imaginations. I'm going to be up there on, the, uh, on TV and you guys are the studio audience. So in a little while, we're going to make believe that there is a thunderstorm happening outside the uh, building, and we have these pretend, we have these make believe uh, uh, announcers, reporters going out to tell us what's going on with this imaginary thunderstorm. And then I am going to be doing experiments up here on the stage to explain what our reporters are uh, doing. So, you guys into that? Going to be good? Yeah. You want to see a tornado, lightning? All sorts of cool stuff, it's going to be awesome. So, here's what's going to happen. When I get up there on stage and I go, ladies and gentlemen, this is DMNS Weather Central, Eddie Goldstein reporting a big round of applause. We're good? Yeah. I think a little run through, a little practice. So I'm going to go, DMNS Weather Central, Eddie Goldstein reporting. Yeah. I think we are ready for the show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is DMNS, Weather Central, Eddie Goldstein reporting. This is the show where we go out to the internet and answer your questions about the weather. So, without wasting any time, let's get right to it. Let's go on to the computer and take a look at our very first question. This one comes from Jay Wiggins, and he writes, When I was in Colorado last June, I saw the worst thunderstorm and tornado of my life. Can you tell me where lightning and tornadoes come from? Well, Jay Wiggins, yes we can. But in order to do that, I want you to use your imagination. Imagine if there's a thunderstorm brewing right now outside of the museum. We have sent reporters out there to tell us what's going on, and then we'll find out just what those things mean. So, let's go to our first reporter. This is Marty Coniglio from Nine News. Marty, this is Eddie in the studio. Can you tell us what's going on outside? Hi, this is Nine News meteorologist Marty Coniglio reporting for Weather Central. I'm live right now in City Park near the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It's clear here right now. It's a beautiful day. But I'm noticing some things. The wind blowing out of the east coming toward me and headed to the mountains. There's a lot of low-level moisture in this wind. We can feel the humidity in the air. It's a little bit sticky. And as that's forced up by the mountains, we're seeing some clouds form. As that air rise is higher and higher up into the colder parts of the atmosphere, more of that moisture will condense into drops and form clouds, and that releases a tremendous amount of energy. We could have some thunderstorms forming later on in the day. We'll keep an eye out for that. Back to you in the studio. Well, thank you there, Marty. Well, Marty was saying that in the summertime, a lot of times the sun beats down on the ground, and if you have moisture, it causes that warm air to rise up into the sky. Now. When it does and gets high enough, it forms a cloud. How many of you have ever seen clouds forming over the mountains, even though it's been pretty clear in downtown Denver? What you're probably seeing is this. You're probably seeing the air coming in, hitting those mountains, going up. The air expands and forms a cloud way up in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Well, that made us curious. We wanted to find out what actually happens when you have a gas that expands very quickly. So we came up with a little experiment to do, which I would like to show you right now. 
I have a CO2 cartridge, carbon dioxide cartridge. It's a gas that's under a lot of pressure, and it's inside this canister. Would you do me a favor, feel that metal, and tell me if it's burning hot, freezing cold, about middle, about the middle. It's, uh, it's not really that cold. And in a minute, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that gas to expand very quickly to see what it does. Now, this is a scientific institution, and so we are going to actually do some measurements. I have a thermometer up on the screen. I think you can probably see it over there. This is the, the actual thermometer part. You can see, actually let me turn the graph on. There's the red line, 70 degrees. You can see if I hold the end, it starts to get a little bit warmer, 73, 76, and the line goes up. So we're going to actually see what happens to our CO2 cartridge. I'll put the thermometer right touching the metal. Thermometer uh, temperature right now, about... 74 degrees, 73 degrees, let's uh, release the pressure. And I see that this one is already spent. But luckily, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, we come prepared. <laughs> so, same thing, I will put the thermometer next to the metal. 66, 63, 61 degrees, 58, 56, 53, 49, 43, 40 degrees, 38 degrees, 35, 33, 30, it's below freezing of water. Would you do me a favor, would you feel that? What does it feel like right now? It's extremely cold, and it's extremely cold because the gas expanded. Well, the very same thing happens in nature. In nature, when the air goes up, the lower pressure causes it to expand, which causes it to cool down and form clouds. Well, we wanted to find out just how much it cools down as it goes up into the atmosphere. So we sent one of our crack educators, Jennifer Moss Logan, out to the National Weather Service where they're about to launch a weather balloon. Jennifer, what's going on out there? This is Jennifer Moss Logan, science educator at the museum. I'm here with the National Weather Service out at Stapleton. Here on the ground, the temperature is 78 degrees, but to find out what it is further up, the National Weather Service sends up weather balloons. These balloons go up to 100,000 feet. As they rise up, they measure temperature, pressure, and other related information, and radio it back to us. Oh, there it goes. As you rise up through the air, the temperature gets colder and colder. In fact, it gets so cold that water vapor condenses into water drops, and those drops form clouds. That's called the dew point. Back to you at the studio. Well, thank you, Jennifer. You know, that was really interesting. She mentioned that as things get colder, the water droplets condense, the water vapor condenses into water droplets and form clouds. Let's see what she was talking about. Here is a little diagram. Those orange dots represent like the air molecules, and the blue dots represent water molecules. Now, the single blue dots are water vapor. It's in this room right now, it's invisible, but when they clump together, that is a water droplet, and that is what you see when you see clouds. So we were thinking about it. We said, maybe these guys would like to see a cloud. Would you like me to see a cloud form right here in the studio? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, all we would actually have to do is cool the room down to below that dew point, and a cloud would form. And that's more or less what I'm going to do. I'm going to be using some liquid nitrogen in order to cool things down. And because of that, safety is always our number one concern here at the museum. So I'm going to put on the gloves and the goggles and all the safety gear. Okay. Here we go. This uh, liquid nitrogen I'm going to pour into the pan. 
And uh, I can't quite see you, so by a round of applause, can you see that cloud forming right now? Yeah. Okay. What it is doing is that's because there is moisture already in the uh, room, and we're just cooling it down below its dew point. But to make a really nice cloud, let's add some water. Yeah. Now I know that that looks sort of like smoke, but it's not smoke because smoke would be rising and this is falling down. So there's one more ingredient and that is below every cloud there is always an updraft. If you remember those updrafts that were in those pictures before. So I'm going to close a little updraft right now. And you see, uh, by a round of applause, can you see if that makes a nice cloud? So uh, cooling down water vapor, giving it an updraft, you get a nice cloud just like that. That's how it happens in the studio, but we wanted to see what it would look like from outer space. So let's take a quick look right now. Starting in 1974, NASA put up satellites, they're called the GOES, G-O-E-S satellites, and instead of looking out into space, they are aimed down at the Earth's surface. Those satellites in geosynchronous orbit uh, transmit their information to Silver Spring, Maryland, which transfers it to NCAR in Boulder, which sends those images to us. And this is what it would look like from outer space if you were 23,000 miles above the Earth's surface. But we're interested in what's going on right now with our storm in Colorado. So let's zoom in on Colorado. There's Denver with the yellow dot. Oh, this is very interesting. Look, some of the clouds are moving in, but a lot of clouds are actually forming right in Denver. They're actually zooming and forming up right there. And I can tell looking at that picture that that's a really tall cloud because I can see that black shadow. But you know, there's even a better way for me to tell how tall those clouds are. Remember when Jennifer said that the higher you go, the colder things get? Well, those same GO satellites have infrared sensors on them that can measure temperature. And so, let's take a look at the infrared version. Dark blue is cold. And you see that dark blue that forms right there? It just doesn't come in, but actually forms. That means that it's rising up. And when it rises up that quickly, that means there could really be a violent thunderstorm brewing. Well, that's what it looks like from outer space, but we have to ground truth it. We have to find out what's actually happening in our uh, outside in our neighborhood. So we sent one of our atmospheric scientists, David Grinspoon, out into the neighborhoods to uh, give us a report. David, this is Eddie in the studio. What's happening out there in Denver, out on the streets? Hello, this is David Grinspoon, atmospheric scientist at the museum, reporting for Winter Central. I'm out here where a very large storm is developing very quickly. I'm standing under a huge rain cloud, and as you can see, there are large shafts of rain behind me. There are large updrafts and large downdrafts within the cloud. Those updrafts and downdrafts separate the charges in the cloud, the electrical charges, and that makes lightning. Each one of these lightning strikes carries over 100 million volts of electricity and can heat the air up to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, that means it's really not so safe out here. So, I think I'd better get inside. Now back to you in the studio. Yes, you should get back inside, because when you see lightning, the only safe place to be is inside. But would you like to see some safe lightning right here in the studio? Yeah. Okay. We can do that for you uh, using a Van de Graaff generator. There is a picture of it. And, huh, that was weird. Um, I do want to mention that if any of you have a pacemaker or any other sort of electronic medical device that you stand further back from those first columns over there because of the electromagnetic waves that uh, come out from that. But here is our Van de Graaff generator. This top part over here is going to represent the clouds and this is going to represent the ground. But before actually doing the experiment, I want to show you what happens in nature. 
What we have over here is a picture of a cloud. How many of you have ever sort of walked along the ground and then you touch the wall and you get a shock? How many people have ever? That's static electricity. The same thing happens in clouds. You have all of that water, that slush, and it's rubbing back and forth into the clouds, and it separates the charges into positive and negatives. Now, for a reason that scientists don't completely understand, usually the negative particles go towards the bottom of the cloud. Now, since negatives and positives attract each other, when you have a lot of negative charges in the cloud, you get what's called the positive shadow underneath. Those are positive charges that form because they're being attracted. And if you take a close look, some of that negative charge is coming down through the atmosphere. That is called the stepped leader. Well, over time, the, the positive charges start going up. And the reason they go up the tree instead of going up the air is because tree is a better conductor of electricity. It's easy. The negative charges are coming down, the positive charges are going up, and when they get close enough together, they make contact, and pow, you get a lightning strike because those positive charges are rushing up to the clouds in order to try to neutralize the clouds. That whole thing takes place in just about a one hundredth of a second, so it happens very quickly. Well, we're going to do the same thing right now with the Van de Graaff generator. And so we've got a rubber band in here. When I flip the switch, the rubber band's going to start going around and round and round, causing a static charge. It's going to build up negative charges on this, just like in the cloud. I will have this metal electrode over here, which is going to become positively charged, and you should see lightning bolts going between the two. So let's give that a try. And if you can see it, give me a round of applause so I can tell. I don't want to look out there. That is good. This is about 10,000 volts. Anybody want to put their hand there? Yeah, yeah, one person. That's nice. There's but always if one. you were to multiply this by 1,000, that's how powerful lightning strokes actually are. It really is quite powerful. And as I say, can be very dangerous over there. Okay, let me discharge that Van de Graaff generator. And let's take one more look as a reminder of some of the safety issues over here because you don't want to end up like that little kid. See, that little kid, the positive charges are going up and into uh, his or her hair over there. That is a very dangerous situation. And that is why if you see lightning, even in the distance, you want to go inside a house. If you can't get inside a house, then you want to get inside a car, but you do not want to be outside. And so, just really quickly, if you see lightning, even in the distance, where do you want to go? In inside. Inside is right. In a house, in a car, somewhere inside is exactly right. Well, unfortunately, Marty Coniglio is still outside, and I want to get a quick report on what's going on with our storm. How's the storm progressing there, Marty? Hey, it's Marty Caniglio again. We're getting kind of worried here. The hail just started, and some of these hailstones are as big as golf balls. Now, these large hailstones means this storm has huge updrafts of wind. If they're strong enough to hold these big hailstones aloft, they could be strong enough to cause a tornado. I'm going to get in the truck and get out of this, but we'll keep the camera rolling so you know what's happening. Huh. That is very interesting. Hail gives you a sign that there are strong updrafts. Let's take a look at what's going on over here. Actually, I've got a picture. If you remember a little while ago, we saw those updrafts, the things that hold the clouds up into the sky. Well, those blue circles over there are hailstones. And actually, let's zoom in so we can see what's going on. What you have is this, is that you have water that's trying to fall out of the sky, and then the air pushes it back up, goes high in the cloud, and freezes over. Now it's heavier, so it comes down again, the air blows it back up, and it keeps going up and down, up and down like that, until it's so covered with ice, it's so heavy, that it falls anyway. Well, in the museum's collection, we have a model, a replica 
of the largest hailstone ever recorded. Look how heavy this thing is. Use your imagination right now. How strong would the wind have to be to hold this up into the clouds without it coming down before it actually came and fell? That would be very powerful updrafts. And so you can tell how strong the updrafts are by how large the hailstones are that are falling down. This really made us wonder. We said, what happens when you have large updrafts? What, what, what is the problem? What does that actually cause? And so we came up with a little experiment, which I would like to show you right now, of what you get when you have large updrafts. Okay, we've got a box over here. We've got a hot plate. It has been going for uh, quite a while. And so if there's warm air rising up and going out the top, in order for it to go out the top, we have cut uh, some slits over here so that air from the room can rush in. And I am going to add a little bit of water to the situation. Okay, so it is rising. A lot of times in Colorado when it's so dry, I add a little bit of mist. And let me just change the lighting so you can see what is going on. There we go. Okay, as soon as you see something form, just sort of let me know. What actually is happening? What do you see out there? What is this? Tornado. It is a tornado. That's exactly right. And what you're getting is condensation. That's what you're seeing over there. The air is rushing in from the different sides. So if I were standing away from a tornado, I would feel the air rushing towards the tornado and then straight up out of the top. And that is all that... Oh, this is getting a little bit serious. Greg Thompson, a storm chaser with NCAR, is working for us. He is out in Adams County right now. Greg, do you see what's going on out there? Is there any tornado where you are? Hi, this is Greg Thompson for Weather Central. As you can see, a tornado is formed behind me here, and uh, it's about three to five miles away. The winds are blowing pretty strongly here. Not too bad, but over there near the tornado, they're blowing a lot stronger, swirling around, rotating. The winds in there can be 100, maybe 200 miles per hour. It's a good thing it's over um, open country right now. There's no populated places anywhere around here, so it's a good thing that nobody's going to get hurt from this. Um, you can see the top half has a bunch of uh, cloud droplets formed. It's in a condensation funnel, and the lower part is just dirt and debris and dust right now. So this is a, it's a moderate tornado, but it could strengthen. And uh, we need to get out of here real soon here, so we'll report, send it back to the studio. Okay, well, thank you, Greg. Yeah, get in that car, get out of there. We want safety is uh, always our number one uh, concern here at the museum. Well, luckily, just as tornadoes can start very quickly, tornadoes can also stop very quickly. And so we have sent Jennifer Moss Logan out one more time so she can tell us what's going on. Jennifer, what's happening out there? This is Jennifer Moss Logan once again for Weather Central. Whew, that was quite a storm, but the storm is moving out away from Denver and breaking up as it goes. As you can see, the cloud tops are getting lower as the storm is weakening, and there's a beautiful rainbow in the eastern sky. We've got a gorgeous evening ahead of us. This is Jennifer Moss Logan signing out. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Well, that's the end of the storm, and it's almost the end of the show, but I just want to tell you one more thing which is how much we know about uh, the science of weather. A lot of that comes because of space and satellite technology. For instance, I mentioned those GO satellites a while ago. It's because of them that we can take a look down and see what's happening uh, in the state of Colorado. We can actually see temperature maps. Believe it or not, those same satellites can follow storms that are near the tropics. They can follow storms anywhere in the world. And even the little uh, GPS that Greg Thompson uses to tell where he is works because of satellite technology, because he is getting signals from satellites to pinpoint his exact position. 
the weather balloon itself has a GPS unit in it, so even it uses satellite and space technology. It all really comes down to this, is that now we look at weather patterns from a global point of view. We don't just look at it from our own backyard. The way I like to think of it is this. Suppose that you had always gone to football games and you always sat at the sidelines and you can sort of see what's going on, and one day you get a, a seat way up in the stands and you look down, all of a sudden you can see patterns that you never understood before when you were just watching from ground level. The same thing is going on with the weather, is that we understood so much just from observing from the ground, but once we got into outer space and started looking down is when we really began to understand the weather. Well, that's it for this time. I hope you enjoyed this episode of DMNS Weather Central. Come for another show. This is Eddie Goldstein reporting. And you don't want to miss the bonus, which is coming right now. Hey, it's Marty Canigley, I'm here for the